I think this slow awakening and consciousness shift is the beginnings to us being able to create an alternate way of organizing ourselves and existing as Earth. Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute in which we interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, asking them all our one impertinent question. And these murky and changing times, confusing and disorienting, what do you see on the horizon that we can cooperate with or what could possibly go right? My guest today is Kamea Shane. She's a Hakka Taiwanese creative, writer, and the author of Thrive, and the host of Green Dreamer Podcast. It's a podcast and multimedia journal illuminating our path towards ecological regeneration, intersectional sustainability, and true abundance and wellness for all. She is known for her perceptive commentary and incisive questioning, and she has interviewed over 200 sustainability, social justice, and public health thought leaders. I really enjoyed and felt a kinship with, in my interview with Kamea as we are both podcasters on a quest to understand uh, not just our question about what could possibly go right, but you know, where is the uh, collective direction for, for health? As, or as we said, toward of, uh, towards the end, what is earth yearning for through us? What kind of healing, wholeness, abundance, um, fullness, fulfillment is earth yearning for through us, through me, through her, through all of us? And, and how do we feel the intimations of earth's desire to be whole and healed um, in our own lives, in the middle of the ent entire muddle that we're in the middle of? How do we feel that? Where do we head? So here's Kamea. Welcome, Kamea Shane, to What Could Possibly Go Right. Uh, as you know, I seek out cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, uh, to help our listeners to see more clearly and act more courageously themselves in whatever ways they choose. Um, and we're asking you to help us hunt for possibilities, for insight, for intimations of something more real and true coming out of all that we're going through. And it occurred to me that podcasters and interviewers, whatever the medium, are really great cultural scouts. Through your choice of guests, through your questions, you or we uh, tease out what is emerging in the culture. We, we shine a light on the path ahead. At least we try to do that. And uh, we may have our own opinions, we may have our own 10 point plans, our books, but as interviewers, we represent our listeners in their hunt for clues and their desire to make a difference in the world. So, you know, in my perspective, I believe yours, it's like this great plow is coming through our way of life now. It's, it's anticipated, it's necessary, but it's still disturbing. It's turning over assumptions, power relations, it's revealing buried uh, traumas. And the pandemic not only threatens health, it's revealed a profound lack of consensus about what's true and the radical justice uprising, the undeniable climate destabilization pushing ever more intense migration. It's, you know, it's just revealing what's been hidden. Um, and it's required us all to dig deeper and learn more. And, um, and I, I think I see this happening in you too. I think I've seen an evolution that you're not on a journey of self-education yourself, becoming more radical, digging deeper into the roots of our intersecting issues. So that's just uh, with all that from your purchase of podcaster, your own learning journey, your personal capacity to see into the murk of the moment. I'm asking you our one question mm -hmm. and all that seems to be going awry. What do you see emerging that we can work with? So what do you see Kamea that could possibly go right? Yeah, that's such a big question. And I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is this question of what does going right even mean? So, you know, does it mean that we have a plan that we hope to follow? And so things are going according to our wishes. And then if that's the case, what exactly is that plan? Who is setting this vision? 
um, and agenda and et cetera. So um, I think there are a lot of multifaceted ways to approach this question. And I've personally been called to explore our paths to collective healing, re eco regeneration and true abundance and wellness for all. And I wanna mention that I've been recently very influenced by the work of Dr. Bayo Akumalafe um, and also Tyson Yankaporta and El Norlada, who I just spoke with this morning and I know you had interviewed um, him as well. Um, but just this invitation to reframe crises as cracks and openings to a different way of being so that even as everything is kind of um, falling apart and uh, you know we're moving into this place into this place where things clearly are not working and I think that in of itself is an invitation to like bring us into this new new way of being and we might not know what exactly that's going to look like and I think it's important to have humility to not be really rigid in our visions of what that could be um, I think we can have different dreams and visions of how we want to feel and, you know, what we want to have when we arrive, but not to be super uh, rigid in terms of how it's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I think just in the pre present moment, what I see is that people are recognizing that what we have right now isn't working and that realization that we are disoriented and that our crises are so deep beyond the tangible, beyond the systemic um, I think this slow awakening um, and consciousness shift is the beginnings to us being able to create an alternate, um, you know, way of organizing ourselves and existing as Earth. It's, it's interesting when you say an alternate way of arranging ourselves. I think about that, too, that we're sort of we're sort of working off of a cultural DNA or a social DNA or an historical DNA that actually doesn't fit our circumstance. You know, we're living in a story that doesn't fit the circumstance of being living beings on a living earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so we're sort of, we're looking for what's the, what's the, the next string, you know, what's the next DNA around which we will start to grow or like, you know, the super saturated solution when you were like in second grade and you put a string in it, you know, and then it, all these crystals formed on the string, you know, we're in a solution. Something's dissolving. Something is in solution, not solved, but in mm. solution and, and something else is forming. And I know you've had a lot of guests who have different points of view about what it, what are the emerging patterns that could, on which we could like, you know, like an architecture, we could build something that would be healthier. And so can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's interesting because when you've interviewed so many people, you're constantly hearing someone say something and someone saying something else that sort of pushes back against what this one person said that originally really resonated with me. But then I hear this other person bring up this other point that sort of like offers a different way of um, deconstructing whatever is mentioned. So I don't even know if I'm capable of like building up this architecture of <laughs> what that might look like. Because for example, we think about finding uh, patterns in our crises. But at the same time, I talked to someone like Dr. Tyson Yonkaporta, who basically, and uh, Dr. Bayo Okomolafe as well, who say that reality and earth are so complex that they can't be systemic and they can't be framed. So there might not be patterns that we could even look for because it might be beyond our abilities to even conceptualize within our, you know, little human minds and the limited ways that we are capable of seeing and experiencing the world. So yeah, I, I it's kind of like a question on top of a question. So it doesn't really of. answer, um, answer, you know, what you said, but I think that's kind of, uh, our role as interviewers too is like whenever someone says something, it raises a new question and it leads us into a different question. So I think that's also part of the process that we have to embrace is um, that it might be not possible for us to have a clear vision of 
what it's going to look like, but we just have to constantly reiterate and hone and create synergies with other people who have diverse, different views that we speak with. And collectively, we might be able to, you know, come up with new ideas that wouldn't have happened if we were to think and ideate, you know, separately in silos. So it's so interesting because I am a thinker. I really love thinking. (laughs) Yeah, I I resonate with that. You know, it's sort of like watching like marbles in a, in a, in a, like a, an environment, you could like massage the environment and the marbles move. It's like watching a kaleidoscope, but, you know, even talking about visions and thinking and systems, I, I, I key off of something you said, it's not going to, we're not going to know what's going to happen, but we can anticipate how we might feel. I think that we're, I think there's something in what what, um, Bio says about that we're not going to be able to conceptualize. Our minds are unequal to the complexity of life, but we can feel it. There's something that we can feel that, oh, this feels right. This feels off. Mm. Um, And so what are you feeling now? You know, what is you as you watch the horizon, what sorts of feelings are coming to you? I think that... Um, like you said, like it's this different way of knowing that is often devalued in our, you know, current system that privileges rationality and logical thinking. Like it's a deep part of us that can't really be measured. It's not really tangible, um, but it's there. And I think a lot of people have a deep yearning for a different way of being. And, um, I think that's also something that ties, um, you know, a lot of people together, even if people just have a lot of divisiveness and disagreement is that I, I truly believe that we share deeper yearnings for very similar things in life, be it, um, you know, intimate relationships, a sense of community and belonging, um, a sense of aliveness and vitality and well-being and life satisfaction and so forth. Um, and then when we come to this reality, like, based on our upbringing and the ways that um, our world is presented to us through our education and social circles, like that deeper yearning gets contextualized in different ways. And we end up interpreting, like interpreting them differently in terms of what we need to do to feel this certain way. And so I think that this present time that we're in, I feel like we're disoriented because something like the concept of growth, um, a lot of people are increasingly waking up to the reality that infinite economic growth is fundamentally incompatible with supporting um, circularity and the regeneration of life. And I think I, what I'm thinking about is how we can pinpoint that to our innate desire for growth, because um, when we orient that towards the right things, growth is a beautiful thing. But this innate desire for growth has sort of been hijacked to serve the growth of the system that's been disjointed from our collective well-being, which would be our extractive economic system that no longer is aligned with um, our sense of fulfillment and um, collective well-being. And what I've also been thinking about is how, given that there is finite matter um, as Earth, material growth is really an illusion because all that's possible is constant transformation. And so we can either transform and trend towards simplicity, homogeneity, and separation, which is seemingly the path that we've been taking, or we can uh, transform and trend towards complexity, diversity, intimacy, um, connection, and wholeness, which is what we need, which is what I believe we need to reorient ourselves towards. So it's not that things like um, growth, for example, is wrong. It's just that we've sort of pinpointed that uh, innate yearning on this thing that has been disassociated from who we really are, if that makes sense. It does. I mean, uh, and uh, I mean, I have like three decades of thinking about consumerism and the, you know, the illogic of consumerism as a strategy for well-being, you know, it's just like more is better and it's never enough is a formula for disease, not ease. Um, And I'm just thinking a lot of it is based on, I, you know, when you said we have a desire for growth, 
I thought, you know, we don't. I mean, yes, there's a desire for growth, but there's also a desire for stability. There's a desire for freedom and there's a desire for belonging. You know, we have, we have, we have our de competing desires and everybody has them. You know, autonomy and belonging, for example. You know, we would just want to be ourselves and then we also want to belong to a group. Um, we want to feel safe and we want to have adventure. And, and it just makes me think that even the question that we want to grow is, a, is even that word of growth maybe needs to be challenged as in um, what does it feel to be like in a mature ecological system where nothing is, things are regenerating, but they're not necessarily growing. Yeah. You know, so it's like almost every desire we have, um, it's not that it's wrong. It's just that it's an opportunity to like, okay, what is this really? What am I really wanting? And is there something I am sacrificing by giving my, you know, by focusing on growth? That's part of what I try to do with your money, your life is just like, you know, there's a trade off here. You don't just get more, more, more. You actually, you get less, you know, less time, less space in your closets. You, things are, are, are like, uh, I don't know how I'm saying it. <laughs> things are, you know, they're in, in a sort of a, a complex duality. There's these mm -hmm. complex dualities and it's in the complex dualities that we're actually evolving. Yeah. Um, and it also makes me think of, I'll just throw this one in. Um, I don't know. Have you ever heard of Manfred Max Neff? He was a Chilean. Mm -mm. I don't think, he, I think he was, not is, but if he is, he's quite old now. Um, economist and he developed a system of, he said there's like nine basic human needs. And then there's a whole variety of ways to satisfy needs. And so, so like if I have a need for adventure, there's many ways to satisfy that need for adventure. It doesn't all have to be like, you know, getting on a plane and going somewhere. And so it lets you think about needs and strategies for meeting your needs. And in a way, what we're trying to do is this basic human desires, we're trying to develop different strategies for fulfilling our desires. You know, sort of like, you know, like just swimming in the ocean versus having, you know, three beautiful bathing suits. You know, it's like, yeah. how do you satisfy that desire for, for the experience of beach, ocean, sun, sky, warmth? Um, so that's just a, variety of, of reflections on, on this question of, of turning this corner. You're talking about we're turning a corner and things are dissolving and nothing's re really quite clear. And, and where do we look inside ourselves or around ourselves to develop enough clarity to take the next step? Yeah. Um, I first want to go back to um, this way of dialectical thinking that you brought up where it's sort of like a yes and and not like a either or so for example like we could want growth at the same time that we want stability um and what i'm thinking of is that i think we actually when we orient growth towards the right things whether that be relationships um intimacy or complexity that is what actually can bring us stability so if we think about the climate crisis and cr climate destabilization, that largely has been the result of orienting growth on the wrong things, which would be, you know, endless extraction um, and a lot of the, this illusion of material growth, which is really just a re rearrangement um, of a lot of elements of earth in ways that disrupt the flow of right. what would be, you know, healthy for our earth body. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm really interested in exploring too how, you know, seemingly oppositional or seemingly binary things are actually true at the same time and how they actually support one another rather than being oppositional to one another. Totally. Um, Complexity thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and going back to your question of where we go to look for answers, um, I think it's everywhere and anywhere. Um, I think it's just having, it's really important as I mentioned earlier to have this humility that 
well, first of all, I know that it's not going to come out of um, the solutions industry um, because I just posted this on Instagram, but like based on this current system of profit maximization, creating a problem and then solving it is more profitable than preventing the problem to begin with. And then, um, sorry, there's a airplane flying by. I don't know if you can hear it. Life Um, happens. (laughs) Yeah. And then, you know, creating, uh, having a problem and then solving it in a way that is sort of incrementalist or just addresses the symptom without addressing the underlying root causes, which would create a new set of problems. Like having this constant chain of problem creation and problem solving, like that is constantly adding to the GDP and would in the end be a lot more profitable, but be a lot more self-destructive. And so what I am um, seeing is that the answers aren't going to come out of the solutions industry um, where you know, the guide, the guiding, uh, star for a lot of these solutions coming out is still, uh, the same rewards of this extractive system, which would be moneyed interests. And so I'm really looking to the fringes, to, uh, voices that aren't really privileged to voices that are, um, usually left out of mainstream media and mainstream conversations. I'm, I'm looking for people that recognize that they don't have the answers, but they have very interesting ways of understanding um, how our current system isn't working, but still with the same recognition that they don't know, you know, what, what it's going to end up looking like. But even that sort of, um, it's like Dr. Bio's fugitive thought. So not being boxed into a specific category or identity or way of being, but, you know, just noticing what is this system asking of us and how do we, you know, kind of run away from what it's asking us to be. So those little ways of, you know, noticing what this extractive system is trying to get us to do and then trying to see, find little ways to escape that. Um, So yeah, I particularly resonate with Bio's train of thought in this area in terms of like, what are the answers? Well, maybe we don't have the answers and we have to go to the fringes and um, move away from all of our current ways of knowing and trying to make sense of the world in order to get closer to the answers that we need. Mm-hmm. Do you, have you um, talked with or, or read Vanessa Andreotti? Um, I have uh, listened to some of her work, yes. Yeah, because she's on the, a similar track, like composting, disassembly, undoing. I mean, a lot of the work is undoing our certainties, undoing our sort of chains of assumptions. So in a way, I'm also hearing that there's a big piece of inner work on this. There's a big piece of the theory is, you know, we're going to solve something on the outer so that we don't kill ourselves and, and the rest of life. But a lot of the work turns out to be questioning our own assumptions and unpacking unpacking a lot of the mindset, a lot of the, the what's in our minds that drives this. And it's not just a personal journey. It's sort of like, as we do this undoing, we share it with others, you know, like you through your podcast. So that it's almost like your podcast is an undoing. It's Absolutely. not a doing. Yeah. It's that's the work of the moment is undoing. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. What comes to mind for me as um, you share this is more and more, of course, many people are talking about biodiversity loss, you know, as an undoing of the creation of life um, over the past, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. And more and more people today are talking about this idea of biocultural diversity, which is a term coined by Dr. Luisa Maffi of Terralingua. But it speaks to how it's not just about biological diversity that is being lost. It's also uh, cultural diversity and language diversity. And it's important to sort of see them as one rather than to separate the ecology from the culture or society from nature and so forth. And in addition to that, something that is internal that I think has also been um, lost is our conceptualizations of currencies. And we're trending towards a simplification of currencies as well. And I'm still clarifying, clarifying and reiterating my thoughts on this so that I can better articulate what I'm trying to say. But 
this idea that, you know, money initially was used at merely as a representation of value to facilitate trade when a simple exchange of items can't be made. But now it's become the end goal. And in pursuit of this end goal, we've devalued a lot of other things that can't really properly be reduced into economic value, whether it is biodiversity or intimacy or relationships, complexity, fulfillment, um, a deeper sense of meaning, aliveness or spirituality. And so this current system that we've set up only recognizes the growth of the simplified monetary value, but pretty much not anything else. Um, and so in this pursuit of this one currency, we're losing um, the valuation of all of the other diverse currencies of life um, that cannot be properly encapsulated in this monetary value. And even, you know, people are talking more about cryptocurrency these days as a way to uh, rebel against big money and big finance. And I'm not like a crypto expert or anything, but what I do understand about it is that it only holds value when everybody using the currency believes that it holds value. And it's the right. same with, you know, other forms of money as well. It's like people believing that this thing holds value is what creates the value itself. And it's interesting because to me, the real forms of value that don't require anyone to really believe in are, uh, you know, ecological, spiritual, and social wealth that will always hold value to us, whether other people believe in what it, what, it's worth for me or not, because all of this is rooted in um, relationality as well. So, you know, we don't need an empty faith in these forms of diverse wealth for them to um, have value and play a huge role in supporting our collective well-being. But yeah, it is troubling when the systems that we've created really only recognize and privilege this representational form of currency um, where it's kind of become the end goal at the cost of simplifying and reducing, you know, other forms of wealth. And so this is, I don't know what it would look like to reorient us towards the diversification of what we value, but I do feel like part of that has to come from our, you know, personal consciousness shifts. So wanted to add that piece out there. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, you're sort of now you're, you're sort of tending into the, the narrative that's in my first book, Your Money, Your Life, you know, which is money. Uh, money is life energy. You know, money is not power, privilege, prestige. It's not even a house. Not, it's not a place to live. It's nothing. It's just whatever you trade your life, you trade your life for it. You give it value. And the trade is, is actually worse than you think because um, you're sacrificing belonging, relationships, time, leisure, um, spirit, spiritual time for spiritual growth, time in nature. You're sacrificing a huge amount of your life for this one thing called money. And the whole drive of the society is to get you to focus on that one thing that we all agree on. It's sort of like money has become the lingua franca of the world. It's the only thing that makes sense to everybody now. And it's really an export from Western society yeah. um and, and 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 it feeds individualism it's really a, about when you talk about simplification another form of simplification is the simplification of like i am a lone individual scared and frightened <laughs> and that i must protect myself and the more layers of protection i can get the and the more people i can make do my will it's really you know, it's really, you get right down to it. It's a fear-based system. Like I am alone, I am vulnerable, I am out of control and I have to do something immediately to deal with that fear. Yeah. But so it's like, you're really right down in some of the root issues, which in a way you, you, we can't solve by by challenging the, the story, because as we challenge the story, we, we actually increase the fear. It's like, wait a second, you can't take my, that story away from me because that story is the only little, you know, paddle I have for this like sort of wildly, you know, gyrating yeah. canoe, you know? And yeah. so it's, um, it really feels as I listen to you, like what we're on collectively is, is this, inner outer journey, you know, it's like protecting what we love in this world, whether it's, you know, 
our, our small communities that are getting commercialized or, um, you know, whether it's, it's natural systems or, you know, protecting the outer instantly has you examining your assumptions, you know, instantly. So it, in a way, it's almost like the dominant system, the one thing you're not supposed to look at is the core assumptions about scarcity, control. You're not supposed to unhook from that. Yeah. You know, and, and it's so, it's just like, you know, even like, like earballs on your podcast, you know, if there's such a thing as earballs, you know, <laughs> there's eyeballs, you know, everything's quantified and, and, and evaluated by numbers. It's very hard to get out of that. So what you're doing, you're standing through your podcast and through your interviews, you're standing right at that, that verge, you know, yeah. right at that edge, you know, the zone. <laughs> yeah. Inner transformation and outer um, regeneration, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge to be in this sort of in-between space because I feel that the dominant culture and society clearly want you to operate out of this one way of being that, that is productivity that is centered on um, what the economic system wants. And for me, I'm sort of putting everything under the umbrella of maximalism as an undoing of reductionism, um, mm. where in terms of productivity, it's not that we don't want productivity. It's that I would want to be fruitful, for example, in my relationships and the things that matter to me that I want to enrich in all, all of the different currencies, diverse currencies of life that um, I recognize has value to my life. And so it's sort of a, it's a reorientation. So for me, this idea of maximalism isn't, it's not a lifestyle like minimalism is. It's not um, an ultimate goal to work towards. It's not a practice. It's this reorientation towards all that can enhance life, intimacy, um, diversity, complexity, fulfillment, and all the beautiful parts of um, what it means to be alive. And yeah, so with this sort of, mindset, a lot of things that I'm also questioning are, for example, even, even a lot of the counter culture movements still take on the same reductionistic lens. So um, for example, I mentioned minimalism earlier, like when people talk about minimalism, what they're centering is material items. Like that is what people generally want to reduce. And in my mind, I'm like, well, reducing what you don't necessarily value doesn't necessarily lead to fulfillment of the things that you want most. So why don't we reorient ourselves towards what we want, which will naturally, you know, kind of fill out the space and create less need to, you know, overconsume and to fill our voids with things that don't really add up to be really meaningful for us. So instead of minimalism, what if we orient ourselves towards the maximization of all that matter to us? And even things like slow living and slowness, I'm interested in reframing that into something like intimacy and intimate living where, you know, yes, we are slowing mm -hmm. down physically, but that slowness is sort of measured through the dominant society's measurement of how productive you are, like how fast you're doing things. Okay. So slowing down to them in their eyes and through their values, it's slow. But in my personal lens, it's a way to allow me to be more intimate in a specific moment. So when I'm physically slower, I can be more intimate with, um, you know, like noticing how I'm feeling, noticing my intuition, noticing, um, you know, leaning into my relationship with my loved ones and my dogs and noticing um, my vegetables and how they're doing. So, you know, slowing down allows me to build intimacy. And my goal isn't to slow down. My goal is to enrich, you know, all parts of who I am, even if that comes from doing nothing. Um, it's still something that allows me to heal and to um, you know, reach a point where I feel more fulfilled and I have these more intimate relationships mm. with all, all the beings around me. And the last one is this idea of degrowth. So degrowth economics is increasingly proposed as a solution um, that is counter to this endless economic growth system. And in my mind, again, through the maximalist lens, I'm like degrowth still centers growth on the economy. But how, how about we, you know, 
orient that towards something like regrowth. So regrowth of all the things that we that matter to us that um, we really want to maximize. So those are some of the things that are um, kind of running through my mind is like, how do we go beyond the tangible to unwiring um, the ways that we're thinking, the, the values that we've been centering and to really reorient that towards everything that can enhance life in ways that matter to us. So yeah, let me wow. leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> that was beautifully said. Beautifully said. And, and, and that it's then additionally, the task is to do that in concert with others who mm -hmm. are also discovering true worth, true values, true happiness, true meaning, and yeah. learning how to together create, you know, manifest, not create, you know, because create is sort of like acting upon, like mm -hmm. God created the world. <laughs> yeah. But to um, evoke out of, out of that relational field. Yeah. Um, and I think it's true that we can only intimate that at this point of the unraveling of the stabilities that, you know, were part of Western civilization. You know, so things are unraveling. We can only guess at what it's going to feel like, what it's going to look like. You know, when the structures that have been driving us in the wrong direction, even though we don't want to do it that way, somehow or another, we get stuck, you know, again and again in that path. Um, and I think that's a, it's hard to be in the space of not only of uncertainty, but of allowing uncertainty to persist. Uncertainty isn't a problem. It's sort of like this interesting phase that we're in that may last for generations. You know, we may not see. That's part of what this, this quest is for. You know, what intimations do you see of that more whole and wholesome world? that um, through your, you know, observations to your guests, if you have any like final reflections, I think you, what you said was probably a final reflection. I shouldn't have said <laughs> anything. <laughs> it was just yeah. so good. But do you have anything you know, else you want to say about, you know, your intimations in this moment of what is growing amongst us, through us, that in, is a little indicator of, of something that, that is, um, represents something going right. Yeah. I mean, I think you summed everything up so beautifully. I don't know what else to add, but um, I guess just this, I think it is very important, even though something like a consciousness shift can't be measured or necessarily seen. I think that is just really important because our consciousness, you know, influences our worldviews and our, therefore our politics and therefore our ideal visions for what we're working towards. And so I think even though it's something that we can't really see, I do feel it happening. Um, this recognition that definitely this feeling that we'll, what we have right now isn't working and more and more people are feeling that at a very deep level. And so I think just this growing awareness as the first step that we, we don't, we might not know where we need to move towards, but we know we need to move away from what this is right now. I think this growing awareness um, of how it is important, for example, to sit with hopelessness, as Bio would say, um, I think that is what gives me some affirmation that, you know, there is room being created or the conditions are being set to allow for this new um, way of being and organizing ourselves to take hold. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really a recognition that we are disoriented and trying to find our ways um, to realign our deep yearnings um, as people, as interconnected communities, as earth, how we realign our yearnings with um, the ways that we end up organizing ourselves and um, just being as earth, so. I love what you said that earth is yearning through us 
for a more wholesome way to be. Yeah. Earth, Earth is yearning through us for health mm -hmm. and wellness, wholeness, relationship, intimacy. Earth is yearning through us. And, um, and so it's what you also say is that we may not be able to think our way into anything other than another paper bag, mm -hmm. but we will feel we earth is feeling through us more the, the directions that are more wholesome. And so it's, it's a really important aspect that doesn't, isn't on some big book with a 10 point plan. And I really appreciate, I appreciate you and your quest and your courage to make your quest public so that we can all learn through you. Um, and I thank you for being on this uh, inquiry. Of what <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's been an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people. Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks also to Asher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.